So uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice opportunity to, to, to speak at this colloquium in honor of, uh, of Jens Weidmann. Um, there's kind of two firsts attached to this. This is my first international trip since COVID started, and it's my first trip to the BIS, so I'm uh, very happy to have both opportunities. Um, let me talk a little bit about my own research interests and, and, and then how I'm drawn into this, these, these type of questions. Um, so I've, I've been very in, interested in building dynamic models, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, building dynamic models that can consent, confront uncertainty in broader terms, much broader terms than we typically te teach in economics classes, much broader terms than, than, than we uh, typically engage in economic analyses. How, do we, how can we think about uncertainty broadly conceived, uh, and how does that interplay with our um, development and use of economic models? Um, so we all kind of, it's, foot, it's recognized climate change to be a very, very important problem. It's important for the private sector, important for governments, it's certainly uh, important for society more generally. Um, I should be clear that I'm coming at this not as a central banker, so I'm not, I, I, um, but it, and, and so I'm coming at this more from an out, outsider perspective. And there's an interesting kind of question across all this, to, to what extent should central banks be complementary to, to policies coming from other places, or to what extent should they be filling in the gaps, uh, uh, you know, gaps from elsewhere? So my own research in the realm of climate change which, uh, uh, and economics has been much more devoted towards the uh, tools for the fiscal side, and that is the so-called social, the so -called social cost of carbon, and what, and, and what roles uncertainty play in that. And also in terms, of, and more recently in terms of the um, um, potentially societal investment in, um, in, in new technologies, that, you know, new green technologies. Again, uncertainty pl plays a central role in these type of, in these type of analyses. Um, so let me see how to work this. There we go. So I see it in general, uh, I, you know, and, and, and I kind of get this all the time when I start saying, well, we need to put uncertainty in the forefront of our discussions of policy and the like, as there's a say, I, I, I perceive this tension, and, and, and many of you here will know this better than me, um, that on the one hand, we often face these phenomenon where there's a limited understanding of the mechanism by which policy influences economic outcomes. On the other hand, the public likes simple explanations and confident statements and, 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 the, and the like. So how do we balance these in order to confront policy uncertainty in open and honest ways um, facing the type of, uh, those type of pressures? I would hope that kind of opening up the set of tools that we have available to, to us can help with this. It's not gonna, I, I, I don't have ways to fully address this, um, uh, these type of challenges. Um, oops. I'll get this right sooner or later. So some overriding important considerations here. In a lot of phenomenon, you know, we, li we live in a data-rich environment. We think we just appeal to data. It's gonna help, it, help us kind of figure a whole bunch of stuff out. Of course, it's never just about data. We always need to have some type of modeling framework to interpret the data, which is, I guess, one of the points that Jacob was trying to emphasize. Um, and in the case of climate change, the historical uh, measurements are all the more of limited value. We're asking questions about pushing advanced economies into realms that we've yet to experience. And so that really requires not, uh, um, conceptual frameworks, models, and, and, and the like. Of course, we can also, also understand that hastily divide policies unsupported by credible quantitative modeling could backfire, and that in principle could harm reputations of central banks. Um, so stated climate ambitions may generate unwarranted warranted confidence and abilities of central banks to address this important problem. And so I think it's important to kind of approach this, uh, recognizing what our current knowledge base is. Um, I should emphasize now, and I emphasize this more, that, that the earlier panel was talking about models and optimism and like this. Um, this is a realm where models are not all optimistic. Many are qu quite pessimistic. And this is also a realm where things like nonlinearities and the like are kind of in the background all the time. And so this, this is certainly a, a very different type of setting than what we talked about earlier. Oops. Okay. So let me just start off just indicating the types of uncertainties that, 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 um, that one can confront. So climate models, they're big, they're complex. Climate scientists them, the, 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 uh, themselves work on ways to do model comparisons. 
to um, and the like. And this plot here is characterizing some of the, um, the output from some of those model comparisons. So let me tell you a little bit more what goes on here. Um, I, um, I, as an economic model builder, can't stick big climate, a bunch of big climate models inside my economic analysis. It just would be completely intractable. Uh, also, uh, climate scientists, when they want to compare models, need, need, need ways to do it that, uh, um, that, that, um, that, that kind of open the door to a simple, more simplified characterizations of, the, um, of, the, of, of model output. And, and so this plot is meant to show you some model comparisons. Literally, how it's constructed is, um, is as follows. We imagine um, we, uh, we go to a whole bunch of different models, and we, in, inside those models, do a so called impulse, an, uh, and a, a so called emissions pulse. It, it's, it, it's a substantial one, more, uh, more than would occur in, in a year. It's much more over multiple years. But then we, tra then the, 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 we trace out what this impulse does relative to baseline trajectories. And that's a counterpart to what economists think of as impulse response functions, but they're but, but tabulated across these different models. Um, so, so what's put together here, there's a bunch of models that are models about how um, <clears throat> emissions translate into carbon in the atmosphere, and other models that translate on how carbon in the atmosphere affects temperature. This, this looks at, 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 say, a bunch of model different combinations here. And, and, what, and the, what we're looking for here is the output across 144 different models. Right? Now, I'm plotting here the mean trajectory um, and the 75th and 25th percentiles of, of the responses, as well as the upper and lower envelopes of what you get out, get out of these model predictions. And what comes out of this is the models really seem to agree that there's going to be um, a big peak in, in uh, there's going to be a peak response in about 10 years. Uh, and, and, and then things will flatten out. There's a fair bit of, disper there's quite a bit of dispersion now in terms of the uh, longer term model predictions. And, and, and that's captured by where this graph ends up in after say 100 years. Okay, now I have to tell you about long term. Long term for economists, if we build models we, that, 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 and, and, and crank out predictions for 50 years, we're being incredibly bold, 100 is, is kind of heroic. To a geoscientist, 100 years is like, Short, a short time scale, and they, and, and, th and they look at their models over much, much longer time scales. And so, so, so a geoscientist would not view the, these as, as kind of long-term forecasts or predi uh, predictions of their models, quite the contrary. And, and in fact, there are much more dynamics that play out over much longer time scales here. They're just not captured by this type of plot. So, so, so this certainly isn't doing full justice to, to the uh, dynamics coming out of geoscientific models. Now, it, now, if I want to take that picture, if I want to take that percent, uh, that the 25th and 75th percentiles, and turn those into quote probabilities, turn this into a probabilistic statement, what do I have to do? I have to treat 100 and all 144 different models equally likely, or equally plausible, or equally weighted. And so, so, we, so, I'm, I'm sort of give a probabilistic statement about this. I've, 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 I've effectively said I'm, I'm going to put all models on, on, on the same equal footing which may or may not be the right thing to be doing here. But this is one exa example of a type of subjective input that, that we need, need to make to make to have hopes of making probabilistic statements. And there's going to be some form of ambiguity about how we want to, might, you know, might want to weight these models in terms of generating predictions. I don't want to, this is, technology is clearly beyond me. I'm there we go. Okay, there's been discussions about, there's been goals about kind of, maybe we should have a goal of a 1.5 degree temperature anomaly. Maybe it should, yeah, previously it was talked a lot about two, two and the like. Now, now um, that's led to things like carbon budgeting. We go from say, well, suppose we want to take a 1.5 degree temperature anomaly and, what, and, put, and then we want to hit it, we'll just go back and figure out how much carbon we should allow to emit in, in order to hit that goal. Well, well, remember the previous plot. There's considerable uncertainty about the mapping between emissions to, to, um, to temperature. So whenever we see temperature goals, you have to remember in the background there, um, uh, to achieve those with emissions, there's a fair bit of uncertainty. And that's what's captured by the previous, um, by the pe you know, previous diagram. So it's nice to announce these goals of uh, these temperature goals, but to meet them, we're going to meet them with a fair bit of uncertainty. Well, it's actually a substantial amount of uncertainty. So I, you know, I always look at these temperature goals with a bit of a grain of salt. 
Now, the question is, what happens when you hit the anomaly? Um, well, here I've just pictorially indicated some different things that could happen. Uh, these, this is not ba based on some hard evidence. It's, it's, it's based loosely on some, some speculations different people have made about potential damages to the economy. This could also include things like tipping point behavior. Once the temperature crosses certain, certain thresholds, that may trigger more dramatic consequences. The truth is we don't know a lot about that. Uh, we certainly d doubt we're going to fall off a cliff at 1.5 degrees, but there could be very severe damages here. Think of this plot as capturing, roughly speaking, the proportional uh, reduction in economic output, or, or it could be quite modest. Um, and, so, and, and so this is another type of uncertainty which we have to factor into the calculations. That, that, that you know, even when we cross these certain temperature thresholds, we don't quite know what's going to happen next. Right? And so this is, now there's 1.5. It could be two, could be shifted out. It could occur, you know, the, you know, the threshold behavior might show up at a much later time. And so, and so the type of models which we're trying to build are ones that put in uncertainty about where, you know, that kind of where thresholds are, uncertainty about what happens after you cross thresholds and the like. So I think it's, you know, uh, these temp uh, are, these, are these temperature targets uh, as policy statements are maybe interesting as political statements, uh, but but how costly it's going to be to miss those targets is all uh, um, speculation about the damages that might occur afterwards, to which we have a, a substantial amount of uncertainty. Okay. So I like to take a broad, note, a broad, broad perspective on, uh, of uncertainty. And this is building off of insights that have been around for a long time, and, and, and it, uh, including a variety of refinements. Okay. Um, there's a lot of discussion, you know, I guess Mervyn King likes the term radical uncertainty. Uh, there's lots of references to Knightian uncertainty. The Knightian uncertainty re reference is really interesting. Um, Knight wrote a very interesting book on, 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 uh, on, uh, uh, on risk, uncertainty, and profit. Um, it's highly cited. It's probably not the most coherent treatment of the discussion of uncertainty, but he certainly put on the table this, in, in, this notion that risk could be different than uncertainty. And, and, and so, so as much literature has been trying to build on that, but it's certainly not by any means terribly clear from reading Knight's book. Uh, um, but, but there's been a variety of subsequent research that, that I think has been quite useful there. So I'm gonna put uh, some jargon on the table that's uh, distinct from a lot of the central bank discussions because it's, because it's gonna draw distinctions between different sources of uncertainty. The first one is risk. So I'm gonna take a more narrow view of risk. I'm gonna think of risk as a situation in which you know probabilities, but you don't know outcomes. Coin flips, <coughs> dice rolls, and the like. That's, that's why I wanna think about risk. When we take risk aversion in, in, in our economics classes, we're te uh, that, that's all about this, th this construct. When, when we build stochastic, dynamic, general equilibrium models with rational expectations, that's all about risk. Um, it's uh, known probabilities with um, unknown outcomes. The second one I'm gonna th th think of as ambiguity. Unknown weights to assign to alternative prob um, probability models. Of course, this has been around for a long time too. This is kind of what statistics is about to some extent. How do we confront uh, unknown parameters? How do we confront the notion of unknown models and the like? And there's a lot of situations in, in, in um, uh, look, look, looking at historical evidence that it's a case that so-called priors get dominated by data. And, and, and so we don't have to think very hard about what the subjective inputs are. That's true in some problems. In the case of climate change, I would say it's, it's, it's really not true. Subjective inputs really matter. And there's uncertainty about what those subjective inputs should be. There's uncertainty about how we should wait across those 105, 50, you know, 44 different models, you know, trajectories. Um, and I think that's an important component to any form of uh, serious uncertainty analysis here. Um, lots of people like to um, quote Bayesian decision theory, which is a beautifully elegant decision theory. It was axiomatized actually by a person from the University of Chicago, when, um, James Savage. But even Savage and, 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 and his um, um, Di Finetti, the, the, the famous Italian probabilist, recognized that Subjective probabilities were things that we could only know very crudely. And so I think it's the, that's the, the subjective inputs and sensitivity to these subjective inputs, putting those front and central, I think is really important for problems like climate change. And finally, the one that's kind of come up before in the previous panel and comes up all the time and, and, uh, is misspecification. The models we write down we know are wrong, 
They're, they're, that they're, if they were complete descriptions of reality, they would, they would probably be useless. Um, they're necessarily simple to give, a, give us interpretations of the um, interesting interpretations of the world. Um, how do we use models as approximators, uh, uh, knowing that in certain s situations to get their, um, there's flaws? So there's going to be some no notions of flawed probabilistic predictions coming out of them. This is misspecification. Now, there are ways, you know, we build on ways in, in, our own, in my own research coming out of um, control theory, appropriately modified and revised and the like. But, but anyway, we're, um, we're working on kind of building methods that, 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 um, um, that, that include formulations that are explicitly dynamic and explicitly recursive in order to address the multiple components here of uncertainty. And so the important point here is I want to think about uncertainty in these much broader terms. And, and, and I think for many policy analyses, this is, this is, this is indeed very important. Um, I often like to think about the use of models in this setup as quantitative storytelling with um, multiple stories. Every model's got its kind of own interesting story. It helps us to interpret the world. It, it maybe you know have its own set of of, um, of uh, policy prescriptions, but there's multiple versions of it, and we have to figure, and, and, and and then we have to wrestle across those multiple versions in terms of thinking about prudent policy making. Now, I would say that lots of sensible business people, lots of sensible um, policy makers, weigh these things Im implicitly already. Uh, that the, these are not things that are, uh, the, the, these type of sensitivity analyses are done informally and in and, and ways that could be quite, uh, quite usefully done. And, and our main ambition here is to put this more explicit and to put this more um, systematic and, 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 and uh, develop more formal tools to support it. So in dynamic setups, I like to think about the following, uncertainty trade-offs. And one can see this often coming out of the models, uh, model predictions coming out of COVID. The models were being used in different ways. Models can be used to produce so-called best guesses. They can also be used to assess potentially bad outcomes. Both of these uses are important, I would say, in policy analyses. And part of the challenge then is how we trade these off, the best guesses against the potentially bad outcomes. We don't want to load everything on the best guesses because we want to guard, might guard ourselves against some type of um, potentially bad outcomes. We don't want to load everything onto the bad outcomes or else we may choose not to get up in the morning. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's an important trade-off here and, 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 and decision-making on uncertainty has to confront this trade-off. The other one, um, one naive response to when I talk about uncertainty and climate change is, therefore, we should do nothing. We should just wait until we learn more. Um, and figure it out. But that's a very naive view uh, because it may be much less, may be much easier for society to respond now, much less costly to respond now under the possibility of bad outcomes than to sit around and wait until we learn things. Imagine that plot I had about damages, where there's severe damages. Maybe once I cross a threshold, I, I, I all of a sudden figure out how severe those damages are. But, but at that point in time, it may be very, very costly to, to, um, to act. And so there's an important trade-off here between acting now versus wait until we learn more. And I think the kind of this decision theory on, under uncertainty really puts this front and central, and I think it's important to think about these issues um, uh, in, in, in open ways. Okay, so now let me talk about uncertain climate economics. I'm gonna lift out a categorization that's used prevalently within this literature. Distinctions between physical risk and transition risk. Now, the first thing I, I, I would want to do is, given difficulties in quantification, is to re replace risk with a broader notion of uncertainty, because I don't think this is risk in the more narrow sense that I defined it. Um, so, I, so I've already talked about a couple of these. One is climate sensitivity. Temperature responses today, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, temperature responses in the future as they respond to current emissions, there's uncertainty. Environmental tipping points. Um, what are the consequences once we cross certain, certain type of temperature anomalies, and how does that spill over that damages the, uh, that, that, you know, that face the economy? How will the economy adapt to climate change? Okay. These, are source, these are kind of important sources of, um, of uh, uncertainty. There's this transition risk. Um, this comes in different portions. I mean, I, 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 
I tend to think of the damages as being somehow connected more directly to, to the physical risk, but you know, we can call there's aspect of that that, that, that are more transitional in, um, in nature. Adaptation, economic and social consequences of climate change. Green technologies, how quickly can we bring new, uh, dominate, uh, new cleaner technologies uh, uh, online going forward? And finally, and this is something I would guess central bankers are, are already very familiar with, is policy uncertainty. Uncertainty put on, put on, on perspective policies elsewhere in the government um, affects how, how the banks that get regulated and the firms that they lend, lend money to respond to things. That's a source of uncertainty, the uncertainty in, in terms of governmental actions. So anyway, but these are all, I think, are, these are inter interesting categorizations. If I had to replace, if I replace the, the, this discussion, I would put these, many of these, in a much broader setting of uncertainty instead of just risk, which I think is important. So now let me talk about some, as I see it, some of the challenges going forward. One is overall stability challenges. Um, what is systemic risk? If, if I think of my, uh, uh, as an economist interested in macro finance, I think of the modeling successes today as being largely qualitative. Uh, the financial crises certainly caught Academics by surprise. Many will say that they predicted crises. Uh, but very few of them predicted the magnitude, the timing, or, or say anything like that. And this whole construct of systemic risk and understanding it really kind of took off as a modeling challenges after the financial crisis and was a much more dormant literature prior to that. Of course, it existed. You know, we, 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 so we certainly had work on banking panics and the like, so I don't want to say it was non existent. But, it, uh, but in terms of quantitative modeling and its challenges, I would say it took off after that. But I think we're still in the early stages of that type of literature, I th I th I th not in, in early stages of that development. Now we're gonna, how do we integrate climate change into that, into our current understanding? Um, where climate change is different is the time scale over which we are gonna seek to quantify its impacts. If, it, if we're gonna look more locally at the impacts induced by say uh, policy uncertainty, perhaps there's a, you know, the time scale becomes quite shortened. Um, of course, we already know in certain, get, get, you know, there's already conjectures about uh, you know, weather response, uh, you know, changes in weather patterns and the like, which we're already seeing uh, you know, some aspects of climate change. But more generally, for there to be a real system-wide problem, it seems to me we're talking about much longer time scales than, 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 than we typically think of in terms of financial crises. So I see a modeling challenge here. I think it's a great one to fulfill, but I think it's, we should be, uh, uh, our current understanding of how to do this quantitatively remains in its very early stages. All right, I failed again. There we go. So I think the one that's uh, perhaps directly relevant and, and, and certainly you know, fits within virtually all mandates and, and, and the like is regulation and supervision of the banking sector. And here I want to distinguish two, two, um, two constructs. One is System, um, systematic risk versus systemic uncertainty. So systematic risk is what uh, we teach in macro finance classes. Uh, it, it says, well, you know, markets are gonna respond to macro shocks differently than micro shocks, which can be fully diversified. Their pricing consequences can be really more, um, more fundamentally different. It's not entirely clear that to, to, uh, to me the extent to which the, bank, um, the supervision and banking sector should be concerns about all forms of uh, systematic risk. Um, systemic uncertainty is meant to be things that are some type of notion of an externality and, 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 and has some high, so special system-wide consequences not effectively handled by uh, existing financial markets. So within this realm, there's one place I could think about a, system, uh, a systemic concern. And that is that the private sector collectively understates the magnitude of their exposure to climate change. If that's a collective phenomenon, and uh, then the central bank's left kind of cleaning up a naivete of a private sector, and that, that's, that, that seems to me to be translatable into, a, into something that's you know, truly a, a, a form of, system, uh, of systemic uncertainty. Um, but how would we, what's the right way to address that? 
I think we're at the early stages of really trying to quantify climate change uncertainty. I think there's some interesting stuff that's been done, done there, but we're still trying to figure out how to do it. It's different in many respects than, uh, than other forms of uncertainties because of our limited historical experience. Um, so there has been attempts of uh, you know, regulators and regulated, uh, you know, working collectively between regulators and regulated on methods to quantify climate change exposure over over alternative horizons, I think can be socially productive. What's different than some of the current ventures along this dimension, from my standpoint, is the, uh, is the failure to embrace a broader not enough notion of uncertainty. And, 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 and the consequent failure of kind of using all the lessons of decision theory. I think there's you know, it's, um, much to be done in this realm. I think it could be very socially productive to get people on the same page in terms of thinking about what are the real exposures to climate change and, 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 and their magnitudes. And it'd be great to come up with agreed upon prudent ways to measure this climate change exposure. So I think this has a push beyond what is currently you know, envisioned by the NGFFs, uh, um, although, although I find their websites to be very revealing and, 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 and interesting. Also, there's this caution uh, and, and um, that um, in any form of financial regulation that involves models-based, there's this interesting study done by Ben Hasselman and Vig about the limits of model-based regulation in that, it's, in that the regulator, if the regulator um, is left to having to rely on the models of the people being regulated because of how big they are and the like. Biases are gonna start showing up. On, on, the, on the other hand, it's a lot to ask of regulators to ha uh, be able to go in and measure all fully the exposures of their, uh, many of the financial ins institutions which they regulate. So there's interesting challenges there, but, uh, once, but, but anyway, this is, this is one of the productive initial steps, I think, that could be taken going forward. I don't know if, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to push this. Here we go, maybe, sorry. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> there we go. So now let me turn to scenario-based stress tests. Okay. So there's possible aim, aims of here, and, and, and uh, you can imagine different you know, variants of this, to explore events through a collection of well-defined scenarios that extend up to three decades. One, one, one aim, there's, uh, there's more than this, could, would be investigate more extreme possible outcomes that climate change could stress the financial system. To date, I would argue there's still only a very limited role of probabilities and dynamic implications for fut uh, future information, and, 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 and uh, I'm gonna elaborate on this in just a few minutes. Um, so, but, but this, um, so let me, so what I'm gonna take here is, um, these are just some simplified plots coming out of the Bank of England from a few years ago. These, these, are, not the current, these are not meant to be the current stress test or the like. Um, th th these are just nice diagrams in order to help support a point I want to make. I understand that there's more, you know, one can do more scenarios and add more complexity to this. And that's so what's traced out here are these different scenarios, an early, action, an early uh, policy action, a late policy action, a no policy action. Notice that the trajectories sometimes follow each other, and then, the, and, and then, uh, and 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 then the future they'll break apart. That that's true across these various different ones. Um, if, as we look at the carbon price, we look at emissions, and then and, and let's say we look at temperature changes. These are given as trajectories. These are not given as well. This one's more probable than this one, and and, and the like. Um, the, NGS, the NGFS has a more substantial discussions of scenarios. They include probabilistic statements within each, each scenario. It's difficult to assess how much of that is risk versus ambiguity in terms of some of the probabilistic statements, but, but, but presumably it's possible to delve into the calculations um, deeply enough to figure that out. But there's still this issue of pr probabilities across the different scenarios. And the notion that you, could, you, you can talk about these scenarios ex ante, but part of the interesting question is here, as you, as the world evolves, we're going to start figuring stuff out. In this, you know, uh, we're going to, you know, show this no po additional policy action versus late policy action. That's going to, that's going to get revealed. So you also want to think about decisions as having a dynamic flavor to them as well. And, the, and, and this kind of static perspective on a scenario stress, stress test can miss that more necessary dynamic perspective. So if the aim of stress test is to get financial institutions to think long term about climate change, that's fine. Um, but 
But the question is how much we learn from potential answers to uh, questions about these particular scenarios. So I, I want to remind us of this uncertainty trade-off issue. How much weight do we put to best guesses versus potentially bad outcomes? That's important for a policymaker, but it's also important for the financial institutions being regulated. You want them to be thinking about these same things. You, um, this issue about do we act now or, to, or do we wait until we learn more? Again, the financial institutions being regulated are people which you want to be thinking about these type of issues. Thus, the banks being regulated will need to confront these trade-offs. And, um, and this kind of works again, yeah, in, in order to assess this, this works against the notion of using these scenario stress tests over very long horizons that, that are inherently static with a limited use of probabilities. So again, here's a place where I think that more effort could be put in to, to, um, to, to, to replacing static scenarios by things that are more fundamentally dynamic, ones that embrace probabilities but also embrace sensitivity analyses as well. I, I don't anticipate this will be easy, and, and, and I personally think that 30-year stress testers are at this juncture somewhat um, pie in the sky, but maybe, as I say, and maybe, maybe it's useful to just get the financial institutions themselves to be thinking long term. So for me, it, it misses important lessons from dynamic decision theory under uncertainty. Moreover, it opens the door to stress test answers that condition on the entire path. If you, really, if you really give me a path that I get to condition on that tells me what the future is going to be like, I can make brilliant decisions. I could make different decisions across the different paths, but at the end of the day, you want sensible decisions across these paths, but also across any other type of intermediate um, you know, outcomes that might, you know, that might emerge. So again, this idea of kind of shunting dynamic evolution of probabilities, um, including their uncertainties, and information revelation can undermine their value. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe this will improve my technological capabilities. Okay, probably not. Um, let me next talk about, there's been discussions about tilting portfolios green. Right? Um, so what's the potential value of central banks for embracing and enforcing things like green mandates as, as, uh, as a policy objectives? There's been two, there's been two, very, re you know, there's two very recent papers on this subject that I find, find really um, informative on this. One is as welfare consequences of sustainable finance. Um, this paper works out in a very simplified model that doesn't include, embrace all the full range of uncertainties, but shows you some settings in which um, a mandate that says that uh, at the same time, um, that, that, yeah, that some fraction of the capital stock has to be um, combined with um, mitigation type uh, uh, efforts that, 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 that include like reforestation or, 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 or say other type of activities can be very socially productive and can, uh, at least in the context of their calculations, and they're only done over a very narrow range of parameter values, can be almost as effective as uh, carbon taxation. So that's a very, it, it's a very positive statement about the potential here of, of, um, of say, green mandates. Uh, the second one is this paper by Papusi, Piazessi, and Schneider about how unconventional is green monetary policy. This one um, is not looking so much at a green mandate, but is instead looking at the, um, at, 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 say, building models for central bank policy um, when it comes to um, trying to figure out better ways to do um, QE type of investments. Um, it it's kind of puts on the table different assets in terms of their um, required amount of intermediation, their required amount of uh, other liquidity benefits and the like, it opens the door to some interesting quantitative calculations uh, that, that can support sensible quantitative easing policies going forward. It does talk about um, inter uh, um, interacting that with kind of green monetary policy that would then be sensible. Um, now, now there, it's it's because because the central bank's doing less in terms of uh, of you know you know green mandates. The it's not going to be a good replacement for say carbon taxation, but it's potentially can be very but but it can potentially be complementary. So both of these have di in different ways offer potentially important rules for policy that tilt towards green production. Um, and so therefore, I had you know and. But now I'm going to say the but part of this. If we look at current 
environmental, social, and government por portfolio standards, they are problematic. They open the door to gamesmanship and they, understand, and, and, and they undermine their socially productive consequences. This is potentially fixable, uh, this is, uh, but part of the role here is what role should central banks be playing in trying to address this? Also, there's a lot of debate and discussion in the um, finance literature about the, the, the so-called risk-adjusted, I prefer to think in broader terms, risk-adjusted expected return to ESG investing. Uh, the studies are kind of all over the map in terms of ones that are finding that are uh, um, a non-trivial difference in the risk-adjusted expected re returns to one find, you know, having trouble finding any kind of notable differences. Um, there's, so there's substantial differences in findings across alternative studies. This is hardly a settled issue. It's, it's certainly an interesting research venture going forward, but, but it still leaves open the door that a lot of the ESG investing now is more um, doing out of show than investors really sacrificing much, much, much in the way of returns. There's, um, there's, there's one interesting study. Again, this is one study, and, and uh, this literature needs to be developed more fully before you want to take these in a, um, by in, in, in anything more than possibilities. Uh, coming out of the um, uh, IMF, I believe, uh, about the limits to climate change mitigation. It looks at these ESG-type standards, and it shows that um, looking at growth of, uh, yeah, growth of emissions based on the different ESG categorizations, and says that, you know, um, finds very little in terms of the growth rate changes in terms of emission, I, I, you know, growth rate differences going forward in terms of emissions. So maybe the ESG standards are leading to firms that right now admit less, but the growth rate implications are, seem to be ambiguous, at least, at least in this study. And, I, and again, this is, a, this is an empirical literature that's really in its very, very early stages. Even this risk-adjusted literature, um, Financial econometricians know it takes a lot of historical evidence to really get reliable estimates of, it, say, risk-adjusted expected returns. So it's, it's, it, this is stuff we're still learning about. And then finally, there's this interesting, very interesting ob uh, finding. Um, e green patenting is often done by, by firms with low ESG scores. So it's actually the dirty firms that are actually right now often engaged in uh, um, themselves and looking for new, new, um, new green technologies. So how much do you want to be punishing them if they're the ones who are also at the same time thinking hard about the innovation? And that's part of what was missing in the earlier studies is, is this role of um, uh, how do we structure the incentives right in order to engage in better investment in the future, in, say, future technologies. Now these problems are in some sense addressable. But the question is, uh, and, and I, I guess it's an open question in my own mind, what role central banks should be in terms of correcting and, and enforcing such standards? So let me, uh, in kind of trying to reach a close here, talk a little bit about the lessons of the social cost of carbon. Social cost of carbon measurements have been out there for a long time, and, 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 and there's been, many people have engaged in environmental economics, have, have been engaged in these. Okay. But there's, um, uh, one of the approaches proposed for the social cost of carbon is a measurement framework that entails four modules. And for me, this is gonna be kind of a lesson in interdisciplinary type of um, research. Um, this is an, by, as kind of advocated by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. They break it down, uh, down in these four different modules. There's one group is supposed to produce the emission scenarios. The next, so the climate scientists are then supposed to tell us the consequences of that. Economists are supposed to then come back and fill in details about damages, what, you know, what will happen there. And then finally, the finance people will tell us how to discount things. And then we'll kind of put all this stuff together. Um, this sounds like an, uh, a nice operational path in order to simplify interdisciplinary research. Once you put uncertainty onto the table, there's critical interactions between these. Think, think of the different emission scenarios. If I'm going along a high emission scenario, and in the future find out I'm damaging except, uh, uh, the economy in a very extreme way, that's gonna lead to endogenous policy responses. So it's hard to assess the plausibility of, that, uh, of, the, of the different emission scenarios without simultaneously speculating about what consequences they're gonna have for damages. Then of course the uncertainty in terms of the climate responses are, are, are kind of right, right in the middle of that. Now comes the discounting. One of the lessons we've learned from finance is in uncertain environments, you, there's um, 
for valuation purposes, there's not like one discount rate. Discounting is uncertain, uh, is, is, is so-called stochastic discounting. You want to discount different possible outcomes depending upon the, the, uh, um, uh, the, you know, the different consequences. So when we're thinking about how to do discounting in a sensible way, you have to simultaneously be thinking about the potential damages along the different trajectories because that's going to affect how you want to do the, do the stochastic discounting. So, these, so there's important interactions making, I think interdisciplinary research can be incredibly important. But, it, but you have to remember that you can't just staple together these, you know, these different groups and expect miracles to happen. There has to be very important exchanges. There have to be people willing to go across these different components here, talking to each other in very fundamental and important ways. Um, so with that, let me close by saying uh, three points. The time horizon over which climate change uncertainty plays out is different than other forms of turbulence in the radar screen of central banks. Quantifying uncertainty in climate change creates some special challenges relative to commonly used risk-based methods. You just can't you know, expect the firms which are reg or the banks are regulating to go to their research departments and say, here, take on this job, because it's, this, is, this is gonna be something which, which is different than what their uh, uh, previous experience has led them to be exploring. Uncertainty about the sources of subjective as well as uh, subjective uncertainty. I'm sorry, understanding the sources of subjective uncertainty as well as model limitations used by both regulated and regulators will make oversight all the more effective. Um, I look, let me just close with my own stab at, 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 at uh, uh, a simplified slogan. Sometimes more can be accomplished by trying to do less. Thank you very much.